In Romans chapter 13, starting at verse 11, it says, And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, starting at verse 36. And I know these are familiar words. Most of us don't necessarily need to be taught, we need to be reminded. At least that's what one fellow once said. And so we're going to remind ourselves of some things this morning. Matthew chapter 24, starting at verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Watch, therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. There is a thought that has been troubling me, and it springs from a quotation in the spirit of prophecy that I'm going to read to you, and you'll recognize it. It's an old familiar quote to uh, those of you who have been in the church for a while, and I know there's some here who are perhaps newer, but I know you can follow along with me as well. This is from Review and Herald, March 2, 1897. It says, Only those who are living up to the light they have will receive greater light. Unless we are daily advancing in the exemplification of the active Christian virtues, we shall not recognize the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in the latter reign. It may be falling on hearts all around us, but we shall not discern or receive it. And that thought has been troubling me, that at the time when the latter rain is poured out, that there will be those who profess to have the special message of God at the end, but she wrote that they would not even recognize that the Holy Spirit was being poured out. Did you catch that? Not perceive it. We, we, they should not discern or receive it. And here's why this is troubling me. Because if the Holy Spirit could be poured out in the latter rain and Seventh-day Adventists would not even recognize that, there's only one thing that makes sense in my, in my limited intelligence, and that is that they don't recognize that because they didn't recognize a lot of other things leading up to it. And so it completely caught them by surprise. And so that troubles me because the Lord has given us the warning and the counsel and the instruction that we need so that that won't happen to us, so that we won't be taken by surprise and find ourselves in a situation where the Holy Spirit is being poured out all around us, it said, and we don't even recognize it. And so if we contemplate these thoughts, I want to share with you something out of the book Great Controversy. 
that is in reference to the verses we just read. One saying of the Savior must not be made to destroy another. Now, what's she talking about? Well, we started with verse 36 of Matthew 24, where it says, Of that day and hour knoweth no man, no time setters. But notice what she says. One saying of the Savior must not be made to destroy another. Though no man knoweth the day nor the hour of his coming, we are instructed and required to know when it is near. We are further taught that to disregard his warning and refuse or neglect to know when his advent is near will be as fatal for us as it was for those who lived in the days of Noah not to know when the flood was coming. It would be fatal not to know these things, not to recognize them. I want to read one more quotation before we jump into a look at some current events right now. But in Daniel chapter 12, verse 13, you're familiar with this with this verse of scripture, go thy way, this is the Lord's message to the prophet, go thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. Have you wondered what that means? Thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. The prophet Daniel would stand in his lot at the end of the days. Here's what we read, second selected messages, page 109. All that God has in prophetic history specified to be fulfilled in the past has been and all that is yet to come in its order will be daniel god's prophet stands in his place how do you like that john stands in his place in the revelation the lion of the tribe of judah who's that that's jesus in the revelation the Lion of the tribe of Judah has opened to the students of prophecy the book of Daniel. And thus is Daniel standing in his place. He bears his testimony, that which the Lord revealed to him in vision, listen to this, of the great and solemn events which we must know as we stand on the very threshold of their fulfillment. Is God going to help us understand these prophecies in Daniel and Revelation? I just read we must know them. We must understand them as we stand on the threshold. So what I'm going to do is take a few minutes this morning. I picked my top five. There are a number of developments happening in the world right now. And someone might feel like I left something out that you should think should be on that list of top five. I'm sorry if that's the case. I picked what I consider to be the top five events that should be rattling our cage. They should arrest the attention of every single Seventh-day Adventist because things we have talked about, things that I remember sitting around the dinner table growing up in Paradise, California, being talked about have been happening before our eyes. What a, a special time it is to be alive. And so I want to pause and pray and ask the Lord that somehow, through His Holy Spirit, He'd help us to appreciate these events that are taking place around us. If you would like to kneel with me, that's fine. I'm going to take some time to pray just now. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You so much for many, many blessings that we've been recounting the last few days, and today on this Holy Sabbath, I pause and ask that you'd send your Holy Spirit, that you'd grace us with the presence of your angels, that the enemy and his angels would be driven far away, and that nothing in my personality would hinder the communication from heaven today. Lord, I pray earnestly that truth could arrest the attention of each one of us here today. We could recognize the urgency of this situation, the times that we're living in just now. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Well, number one, I invite you to turn to Luke chapter 21, the parallel chapter from what we were just reading there in Matthew 24, Luke chapter 21, verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and 
upon the earth, distress of nations. With perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Now I can't think of a better scripture that captures the evening news recently. And so many have seen these scenes from the Gulf, right? Things that have been happening. Now, I, I want to read to you a remarkable statement. This is from Testimonies, Volume 6, page 408. The restraining Spirit of God is even now being withdrawn from the world. Hurricanes, storms, tempests, fire, and flood, disasters by sea and land follow each other in quick succession. Science seeks to explain all these. If you've watched carefully in the news over the last year, you've seen the fulfillment of these words. Science seeks to explain all these. The sign thickening around us, the signs rather, thickening around us, telling of the near approach of the Son of God, are attributed to any other than the true cause. Okay, what is the true cause? Men cannot discern the sentinel angels restraining the four winds that they shall not blow until the servants of God are sealed. But when God shall bid his angels loose the winds, there will be such a scene of strife as no pen can picture. This is from Review and Herald, November 8, 1892. Again, we see hurricanes, but notice what it says here. The day of test and purification is just upon us. Signs of a most startling character appear in floods, in hurricanes, in tornadoes, in cloud bursts, in casualties by land and by sea that proclaim the approach of the end of all things. Now catch this. The judgments of God are falling on the world that men may be awakened to the fact that Christ will come speedily. Why are we so afraid to refer to these things as the judgments of God? And yet that's what I read. Now it's going to get more specific in a minute. But of course... I'm sure you know, we're thinking especially of Katrina, which was considered the worst disaster in the U.S. history. But I want to, I got to tell you something I saw on the internet. I get my news usually on the internet. We don't uh, get television where we're at, where we live. And so every once in a while, I check out the headlines on the internet. And I found a most remarkable headline. I don't know if anybody here saw it. I expect maybe somebody did. It wasn't up very long, at least not on the internet. And it captured my attention because it was comparing Katrina to something in the past. And I believe that the news people had no idea that the statement they were making was highly prophetic. But it's one of these things that ought to be recognized by Seventh-day Adventists, for sure. And it was just as Katrina was, the, the, the situation was worsening, and the concept of the loss of lives, the casualties from this thing began to dawn upon everyone. And this comment was made that with the casualties in mind of what they would expect to find, that that would make Katrina the worst disaster in U.S. history since, did anybody see it? Since the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. That's what they said. Now, why do I believe this is prophetic? Because in the book, Last Day Events, here's what we read. As we near the close of this earth's history, we shall have the scenes of the San Francisco calamity repeated in other places. These things make me feel very solemn because I know that the judgment day is right upon us. The judgments that have already come are a warning, <clears throat> but not the finishing of the punishment that will come on wicked cities. Now I want to take just a minute to re refresh your minds about the San Francisco earthquake. This is from uh, April. She's, Mrs. White is referring back to April of 1906. She says, while at Loma Linda, California, there passed before me a most wonderful representation. During a vision of the night, I stood on an eminence from which I could see houses shaken like a reed in the wind. Buildings, great and small, were falling to the ground Pleasure resorts, theaters, hotels, and the homes of the wealthy were shaken and shattered. Many lives were blotted out of existence, and the air was filled with the shrieks of the injured and the terrified. Now, please catch this next paragraph. The destroying angels of God were at work. One touch and buildings so thoroughly constructed that men regarded them as secure against every danger quickly became heaps of rubbish. There was no assurance of safety in any place. 
I did not feel in any special peril, but the awfulness of the scenes that passed before me, I cannot find words to describe. It seemed that the forbearance of God was exhausted and that the judgment day had come. Now, she says on April 18, two days after the scene of falling buildings had passed before me, I went to fill an appointment in the Carr Street Church, Los Angeles. As we neared the church, we heard the newsboys crying. San Francisco destroyed by an earthquake. With a heavy heart, I read the first hastily printed news of the terrible disaster. Now that summer, in July, the Review and Herald uh, printed an article. It was the words of Mrs. White, looking back on this whole experience and then seeing the San Francisco, the devastation in San Francisco. Here's what she said. Out of the cities... Out of the cities, this is the message the Lord has been giving me. The earthquakes will come, the floods will come, and we're not to establish ourselves in the wicked cities where the enemy is served in every way and where God is so often forgotten. I could read more of it, but I'm going to keep moving along because I was uh, especially interested that what we witnessed in the Gulf Coast there was reminiscent of what we saw less than a year ago. Now, certainly you know what I'm thinking of now, right? The tsunami, truly uh, the most remarkable natural disaster that we've seen in, in the world, and in particularly in our lifetimes. Have you ever seen anything like this? Hundreds of thousands of lives swept away. Mrs. White had predicted that entire cities would be swept away, and friends, they were swept away. And what captured my attention with the tsunami was an amazing description from the book Great Controversy. The Lord is so good to us, He is trying to remind us of passages in Scripture. He's trying to remind us of scenes of the past. And you will remember that in Revelation, it speaks of that great earthquake that would be a harbinger of the end of all things. Remember that? The Lisbon earthquake, which was a harbinger. You know, after the Lisbon earthquake, all over the world... A day of fasting and prayer was called because the end was near. Now, here's the amazing thing. In the book Great Controversy, the Lisbon earthquake is described in detail, and I'm just going to read one short paragraph. This is from page 305. The sea first retired and laid the bar dry. Now, does that sound familiar? The ocean retreated over there in those countries, Thailand and, and Sumatra. You remember hearing about this? The children went down to play on the beaches because the sea had retreated. They were, it was exposing all sorts of sea life. Tourists went out with their cameras to take a picture of this. Here's what she said about Lisbon. The sea first retired and laid the bar dry. Now here's an accurate description of a tidal wave. How many of you always thought a tidal wave is just this big crashing, curling wave that comes in? And what we witnessed was just an incredible surge of water that just kept coming deeper and deeper, sweeping everything away in its path. Listen to this. The sea first retired and laid the bar dry. It then rolled in, rising 50 feet or more above its ordinary level. Among other extraordinary events related to have occurred at Lisbon during the catastrophe was the subsidence of a new quay built entirely of marble at an immense expense. A great concourse of people had collected there for safety as a spot where they might be beyond the reach of falling ruins. But suddenly the quay sank down with all the people on it. Not one of the dead bodies ever floated to the surface. The Lord wants to remind us these are incredible harbingers that we're approaching the end of all things. All right, number two on my list of top five. Matthew chapter 24. Back to Matthew 24. Verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Now, because I have five and I want to get through them, I'm going to move quickly here. And I'm sorry, I don't have time to really cover this in detail. We have this message. You can listen to this message online at our webpage. I'm talking about the message that just deals with the abomination of desolation issue. Um, our webpage is at backtoenoch.org. Backtoenoch.org. You can stream that message there. <clears throat> or if you ask, 
Laura. She'll jot a note down and we'll send you a copy of that message, all right? But let me just give you the, the uh, super, super abbreviated version of this. The abomination of desolation has seemed to be a mystery to so many people for so long, but it's really very simple if we follow a basic rule of Scripture interpretation. And that is precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, line upon line. Compare Scripture with Scripture, and the mystery vanishes. Now, if you compare Luke chapter 21, we'll turn there and keep your hand at Matthew 24 so you can come back. Jesus gave some additional information. Well, I should say this. Dr. Luke recorded some additional information there that wasn't in Matthew, although Jesus spoke these words to the disciples. It's it's uh, wonderful that the Lord gave us the Gospels, isn't it? Because we have the different perspectives and we have them catching different details for us, and it's all important. But in Luke chapter 21, verse 20, it says, When ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let them which are in the midst of it depart out. Let not them that are in the country enter thereinto. All right, the abomination of desolation in the time of Jerusalem was constituted by the Roman armies coming and surrounding the city of Jerusalem. Now, somebody's thinking, well, how could that be the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place? You have to remember that there was an area which extended outside the city walls of Jerusalem that was designated as the holy ground or the holy place, not to be confused with the holy place in the sanctuary. And so when the Romans came to take the city, they laid siege on Jerusalem and they planted their pagan banners in that area of ground extending around the city walls. Now, just so you don't think I'm making this up, I'll just read it to you. This is uh, from Great Controversy, the book Great Controversy, page 26. The Savior warned his followers, when ye shall see the abomination of desolation, stand in the holy place, etc. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Now listen, here's the explanation. When the idolatrous standards of the Romans should be set up in the holy ground, which extended some furlongs outside the city walls, is that clear? Then the followers of Christ were to find safety in flight. So the Romans knew what they were doing. And on those banners, I already indicated, it, they were pagan banners. That's because depicted on them were the Roman gods. So they came and planted them. They, they knew about the holy ground. They knew that this would be a, an insult, at least, to the Jews, and it was showing their intentions to take the city. But if you remember the story, one day, for apparently no reason, the Roman armies retreated. The Jewish, Jewish armies chased after the Roman armies. And by the way, Christ's followers in the city recognized that the sign had come. They recognized the sign when the Roman armies laid siege on Jerusalem, but they couldn't get out until the Roman armies left. And we read in Great Controversy that the disciples of Jesus fled. They went to a place in the mountains called Pella. And then, about three and a half years later, the Roman armies came back. The first time it was under Cestius. The second time it was under Titus. That's the siege that most of us have heard a lot about because that's where the Roman armies camped in and watched what happened in the city. Millions of Jews, were told, were there for the Passover. And because of fighting and greed in the city, the stores of food had been wasted and a horrible famine followed. And what happened and what the Roman soldiers witnessed in the city of Jerusalem became so deplorable that they finally stormed the city. Titus had told his men, stay away from the temple but he lost control of his own men. Thousands and thousands had run to the temple for safety, and we, we read that blood flowed like water down the steps of the temple. That was the second siege. Now, it's very simple. In the Testimonies, Volume 5, Mrs. White reminds us that Matthew 24 has an application for our day, that these prophecies have a dual application. And she helps us connect the dots. This is page 464 in Testimonies, Volume 5. The time is not far distant when, like the early disciples, we shall be forced to seek a refuge in desolate and solitary places. Here it is. Now listen. As the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was the signal for flight to the Judean Christians, so 
the assumption of power on the part of our nation in the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. It will then be time to leave the large cities preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes in secluded places among the mountains. Do you see the parallel? Now, even the historians will tell us that pagan Rome handed the scepter of power to papal Rome, the Roman Catholic Church. Now, I know I'm getting into an area here that might be new for some of you, but this church is full of missionaries. And grab a missionary in this church, because I'm not going to have time to go through an in-depth study on this one this morning. But if this is new to you, you need to go through a Bible study, and there's some great material available, and I know that the pastor here and the Bible workers here can connect you with that material. But suffice it to say that the modern day parallel, the abomination of desolation, is the attempt of Rome once again to lay, lay siege this time on the people of God. And it comes this time not in just merely little flags, but that which is the banner of Rome, a false Sabbath, a counterfeit Sabbath. Now, there's something very important about this. Uh, I wish I had time to be more detailed here. I would encourage you to just ask for the CD on the Abomination of Desolation or listen to it online. This is how I discovered this issue. I knew after reading the book Country Living that we'd been given the warning to leave the cities a long time ago. How many of you have read the book Country Living? All right, some of you haven't. You can download that off our webpage for free too. I encourage you to read that. I grew up understanding that one day the Sunday law is going to come. That's the sign to leave the cities. But here's what happened to me. As I began to study the issue out, I found out we were told to leave the cities a long time ago. And I was grappling with this. How does this make sense? If we're not supposed to leave yet, why did Mrs. White tell us 100 years ago to leave? I read a statement a moment ago that Mrs. White pinned in reflection of the San Francisco earthquake. But there are others as well. Listen to this. The time has come. When as God opens the way, families should move out of the cities. The time has come. Well, I was grappling with this issue and pondering it. And one day, it seemed as if the Holy Spirit was trying to bring a thought to my mind. And that was, you know, Dave, why don't you take the book Country Living, tear it apart, and lay it all out in chronological order as to when those statements were written and see if you find a pattern. And so I did that and I discovered something amazing. The statement I read to you a moment ago, the parallel of the siege around Jerusalem and the Sunday law. That's found in Testimonies, Volume 5, as I said, as the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was the signal for flight to the Judean Christians. So, the assumption of power on the part of our nation and the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. It will then be time to leave the large cities preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes in secluded places among the mountains. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is this. For Christ's disciples in Jerusalem, what were they to do when they saw the sign? Get out of the city. But they couldn't leave until the siege went away, right? When the Roman armies retreated, then they could leave. But now the prophet tells us something important. She says the parallel in the last day, when that sign comes in the last day, you won't just flee right to the mountains. You will begin a process of moving out of the large cities first and then the smaller ones, and finally to the mountains. Did you see that? It's very important. It's, a, it's a, a systematic process. Now, somebody says, why is that? Well, anybody who has moved out of the city, you know why that is. It takes time, doesn't it? It's quite a process to disentangle yourselves. And the council not only tells us to get out of the cities and that it's urgent, but we must do so wisely and not make rash moves. And so the planning that's involved in finding employment and finding a home and looking for the best place to live and a good place to raise your family, all those things take time. And so Mrs. White said, when the sign would come, it would then be time to leave the large cities, preparatory to leaving the smaller ones, finally for secluded homes isolated among the mountains. Well, I found myself one day in the ABC and I, I grabbed the little book, Country Living, and I started flipping through it. And I went right to the last page. I went there because that's where the statement is I just read. The connection from Testimonies, Volume 5, between the siege around Jerusalem and the sign for us. 
And I looked down at the date, and the date was there. It's one of the earlier statements in the whole book. It's on the last page, but it's one of the earlier statements, 1885. And remember, it says, it will then be time. I flipped back a few pages, and my eyes fell on these words. The time has come. I looked at the date. It was 1903. I realized something happened between 1885 and 1903 that caused the prophet to go from saying the time will come, the time is not far distant, to the time has come. And remember, what did she tell us the first step would be when we would see the sign? Leave the large cities. Look at this statement. 1900 is when she wrote this. Get out of the large cities as fast as possible. Something happened. What's the point of all this, by the way? The point is we're talking about the abomination of desolation. Most Seventh-day Adventists think this sign is in the future. Reality is it's in the past. And just so you understand, reality is we're living in the middle of it. How many sieges were there around Jerusalem? Two. It was between the two sieges that God's people left. The first siege must have already come because Mrs. White said, get out of the large cities. In fact, listen to this. This is truly amazing. I'm going to read the description one more time from Great Controversy regarding the siege of, the, of Jerusalem by the Romans. When the idolatrous standards, listen to the language, when the idolatrous standards of the Romans should be set up in the holy ground, which extended some furlongs outside the city walls, then the followers of Christ were to find safety in flight. In 1897, you see, we, we're, we're moving back. We're getting closer to 1885. 1897, listen to this. The Protestant world have set up an idol Sabbath, almost identical language, in the place where God's Sabbath should be. They're treading in the footsteps of the papacy. For this reason, I see the necessity of the people of God moving out of the cities. Somebody's asking, what was it? Where was the sign? Well, if you look at history, you'll find that the year 1888 was very important, not only because of Minneapolis and Jones and Wagner and the most precious message of righteousness by faith, but in 1888, Senator H.W. Blair from New, Ham New Hampshire introduced into Congress what we now call the Blair Bill. This was the first time ever that a bill was introduced into Congress which would make Sunday the legal day of worship in all federal territories. There had been Sunday laws on state blue books, but this was federal. In December, there were hearings. December of 1888, there were hearings on the Blair Bill. Now, you can imagine Seventh-day Adventists were alarmed, and so we sent A.T. Jones back to lobby against the passing of that bill. And the bill did not pass. Now, someone says, but wait a minute. I thought the Sunday law has to pass. You, you've got to go back and, th and think of our historic parallel that the spirit of prophecy laid out for us. The parallel is the siege around Jerusalem. The f did the first siege result in a desolation of Jerusalem? No, it was the second siege. The first siege was the sign. Then there was a retreat, and then there was a period of time, a reprieve. And then the Roman armies came back the second time. You understand where we're going with this, right? Now, some of you have heard this study before, but some of you have not. We have been living between the two sieges. The first siege was launched in 1888. By the way, I've got to read an amazing quote, and then we're going to move on. An amazing quote. This is January 1, 1889. Keep in mind, the hearings on the Blair Bill have just taken place. The Blair Bill, by the way, was backed by a, an organization called the NRA, not the National Rifle Association. The National Reform Association, that's what it was called. And another organization called the Lord's Day Alliance. You've heard of that one. And there were others as well, but those are two prominent organizations. The National Reform Association was the main backer of the Blair Bill. And notice what Mrs. White said about all this. We must show to the world that we recognize in the events that are now taking place in connection with the National Reform Movement, the fulfillment of prophecy. That which we have for the last 30 or 40 years proclaimed would come is now here, and the trumpet of every watchman upon the walls should raise the alarm. What prophecy? 
could the Blair Bill and the developments surrounding the National Reform Association have been a fulfillment of other than the prophecy that a Sunday law would come? She said that was a fulfillment of prophecy. I've had people tell me, but the Blair Bill didn't pass. It's unimportant. If that's true, then Mrs. White would have made a mistake when she said that. She said it was a fulfillment of prophecy. We must sound the alarm. And by the way, the Roman armies are coming back now. Have you heard it? The sound of the Roman armies, friends. You've, heard, you've all heard of Dies Domini? By the way, I've got I to read something else to you I have here. You can download this if you're interested in it. It's a letter from the Lord's Day Alliance. It's on our webpage. A friend of mine is on their mailing list. He received this letter from the Lord's Day Alliance dated December 2001. Sound familiar? Right after the infamous 9-11. Listen to this. The national tragedy that occurred on September 11 in New York, Washington, and Pennsylvania has changed our perspective. Now, this is an organization that's interested in Sunday legislation, folks. Frankly, it has caused even those who lack a spiritual thermometer to consider their faith, many for the first time in their lives. We stand on the verge of an unprecedented opportunity to proclaim the message of the Christian Sunday in a manner unseen, at least in my lifetime. Their intentions are clear. Here's the main point. At the bottom is the official letterhead of the Lord's Day Alliance. You want me to read it to you? Serving the churches and the nation since 1888. That's what it says. Friends, we're there. We're living in the midst of the modern-day fulfillment of the abomination of desolation. By the way, along with this understanding of the abomination of desolation being in fulfillment before our very eyes comes with it the understanding of a resurgence of the papacy like we have never seen before. This was a headline actually dating back to July 4. This is from the New York Times. Even former skeptics are warming up to the Pope as the ex-watchdog turns gentle. How's that for a headline? But one of the things I found interesting is at the end of this rather short article, it wasn't very long, um, it, well, let me read this other quote to you first. Here was a, uh, a homemaker, Teresa La Peruta, 59, homemaker from Naples, who along with thousands of other Catholics cheered Benedict recently in St. Peter's Square. Here's what she had to say. At first, I wasn't sure about this Pope. I have to be honest. I didn't like him. And she wanted to say this, he's beginning to win me over. I hope he does so more and more. You might say, well, what does this have to do? She's just a housewife out there among millions and millions of people. Well, her thoughts are being reflected by many other people. I just found this article this week as well, which I thought was so interesting. It's, uh, the title is Religion Not an Issue in Alito Nomination. And of course, we're talking about Samuel Alito potentially to sit on the Supreme Court. And... Of course, if that happens, for the first time in American history, there will be a Catholic majority on the Supreme Court, five out of the justice, justices being Catholics. But what was just as significant, as we don't know exactly what's going to happen on that front, was the way this article read. This is from uh, the Messenger Inquirer. It's from the town of Owensboro, Kentucky. And I'm just going to read a few lines to you. When John F. Kennedy ran for president more than 40 years ago, his Catholic religion was controversial. Samuel Alito Jr. could soon make history by bringing a Roman Catholic majority to the U.S. Supreme Court. Not even Catholics, though, seem excited about the milestone. Some observers say it's a sign of how well a group that was once vilified in this country has assimilated into American society. The lack of newsworthiness is a very good sign, said Bill Conroy, professor of political science and history at Kentucky Wesleyan College. He was raised as a Catholic. The lack of controversy over Alito's religion pleases me very much, said Bill Kugel, a local businessman and farmer whose mother was a Baptist and father was a Catholic. This is the way we should have been a long time ago. Clearly, the whole world is wandering after the beast and this whole issue of the abomination of desolation is bigger than just the getting out of the city's message. It signifies the resurgence of the papacy as we have never seen before. 
What an incredible time to be alive. Number three, Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. Revelation 13, 11, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Okay, come on now, Seventh-day Adventist scholars. What is this talking about? What power does this creature represent? The United States. And the features of this animal are very important. Has two horns like a lamb. Help me out. What does that mean? Horns in prophecy represent what? Power. Power. Notice these horns don't have... All right, we're coming there. Notice that they don't have crowns, do they? If they had crowns, what would that signify? Kings, kingly power. So these are another kind of power undergirding this nation. And our call porter up in the front just said, what? Say it again. Religious and civil liberty. Religious and civil liberty. The two pillars, the foundation pillars of our nation. What does it mean when it says he spake as a dragon? What's that mean? Let me read something to you. This is from Great Controversy, page 442. The lamb-like horns and dragon voice of the symbol point to a striking contradiction between the professions and the practice of the nation thus represented. The speaking of the nation is the action of its legislative and judicial authorities. Did you catch that? The speaking is the action of its legislative and judicial authorities. It speaks by the laws that it invokes, that it carries out, that it enforces. Notice, I'll keep reading now. The prediction that it will speak as a dragon and exercise all the power of the first beast plainly foretells a development of the spirit of intolerance and persecution that was manifested by the nations represented by the dragon and the leopard-like beast. The statement that the beast with two horns causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast <clears throat> indicates that the authority of this nation is to be exercised in enforcing some observance which shall be an act of homage to the papacy. Such action would be directly contrary to the principles of this government, to the genius of its free institutions, to the direct and solemn avowals of the Declaration of Independence and to the Constitution. So packed in that one verse is not only the prediction that this nation would arise, built on the powerful ideals of civil and religious liberty, but is also the prediction that it would speak, that there would come legislation that would be a direct contradiction to that. And friends, we're living in a time when we have now seen the most remarkable demise to the Constitution of the United States ever witnessed in the history of this nation. You realize that for all practical purposes, the Bill of Rights, the freedoms that the Bill of Rights guarantees are no longer really guaranteed for you. You realize that, don't you? And of course, many people think of the Patriot Act, the U.S. Patriot Act, in which with a huge sweep, the Bill of Rights is essentially thrown out the window. The First Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the Sixth Amendment. You know, one of the things that disturbed me when all this started to happen is that my attention was pointed to this matter by some friends from Europe. Now, I know nothing prejudicial about what I just said, but I have some friends from Europe that came to this country, and they began to talk to me about things that were alarming them around us happening, things from our government. And I discovered something, that people who come to this country and are naturalized typically understand the Constitution of the United States far better than we do who grew up here. And this is troubling to me, and it troubled me enough that I went down to Barnes & Noble, and for a few bucks I picked up a little book uh, that has the Constitution of the United States in it. Declaration of Independence, and I started reading it, and it was like a new document to me. I know somewhere back in the recesses of my education, I must have learned about this, but I started to read the Bill of Rights, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, and I'm not going to take the time to go through this this morning, but I would like to cite one example that is very, very troubling. By the way, if you are interested in some good reading material on this. You realize that now 
some mainstream sources are beginning to point to us these incredible events and the demise of our Constitution, and it used to be considered somewhat fringe. There are two books. One is called Constitutional Chaos, and it's by an author named Andrew Napolitano. Does that name ring a bell to anyone? Andrew Napolitano is a um, news correspondent, a judicial correspondent for Fox News. He has a lifetime judgeship, and he wrote this book called Constitutional Chaos. The other one is called War on the Bill of Rights. One is from a liberal, the liberal side, politically. The other is from the conservative side. Now on both sides, there are some honest souls out there that are raising the cry of alarm about what's happening to the Constitution of the United States, and it doesn't matter Republican or Democrat. They're willing to be honest about this, and it's especially interesting when those on the conservative side, the Republican side, will speak out. But let me read to you a little bit. This is regard to the Fourth Amendment. By the way, is the Fourth Amendment clear in your mind? You know what it says? The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. No warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly <coughs> describing the place to be searched, the person or things to be seized. By the way, somebody might be thinking, why are we talking about this on Sabbath? If you read Great Controversy, do you know that Mrs. White refers to the Constitution as truth? That's right. She refers to that grand old document and uses the word truth for this document that our nation was founded on. But let me just read this to you. This is referring to December 13, 2003, almost two years ago. This was a Sabbath, by the way. So presumably none of you were at home watching the news but you heard about it after the fact. On Saturday afternoon, December 13, 2003, the right to privacy suffered another serious blow. On that day, the Intelligence Authorization Act for fiscal year 2004 was signed into law. He goes on and says this, Now, without you knowing it, the Justice Department, whose lawyers and agents have sworn to uphold the Constitution, can easily subvert it by learning where you traveled, what you spent, what you ate, what you paid to finance your car and your house, what you confided to your lawyer and insurance and real estate agents, what periodicals you read without having to demonstrate any evidence or even suspicion of criminal activity on your part. And the government can now, for the first time in American history, without obtaining the approval of a court, read your mail before you do and prosecute you on the basis of what it reads. Now, I'm not reading from some fringy guy here. I'm reading from a judge. Um... I don't have time to, to share all this with you. I want to just touch on this. This refers now to the First Amendment. Hopefully we all know about the First Amendment, right? I went back and read it again. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble. Now, there was a poll that was done in 2002 sponsored by... Uh, an organization called the First Amendment Center based at Vanderbilt University. And here is what they found. They polled Americans. 49% of Americans polled said that the First Amendment gives us too much freedom. Now, friends, that's almost half of Americans think the First Amendment gives us too much freedom. The only thing I found that was comforting in the poll was this. Only 18% knew that freedom of religion is a First Amendment right. But you can see a little bit of knowledge can be dangerous. Now, <clears throat> some of you might have heard of the Lackawanna Six. Anybody hear about the Lackawanna Six? Six Arab Americans, five of them born in America. One naturalized, became a citizen of America. The reason their story is so important, July 2003, a decision was handed down. The U.S. Department of Justice had a special celebration because these six men were going to jail to serve terms of anywhere from six to nine years. You want to know what their crime was? The only crime brought against them was they listened to Muslim preachers. That's all. They had no evidence of any criminal activity, no evidence of a plot, nothing. All those men did was listen to Muslim preachers. You say, how does this happen? Well, 
Initially, the case was thrown out. The six young men demanded that they have a trial. And that's when attorneys representing the U.S. government came to them and said, if you demand a trial, we will label you as enemy combatants. You will be stripped of all your rights. You'll be held incommunicado in isolation. You will not be able to have a lawyer. That's right. You can find, if, all you have to do is punch in on the inter internet, Lackawanna 6, and you can read the whole story. It was in the news, but where was the outcry in America? I say, where was the outcry among Seventh-day Adventists? Friends, as we see the demise of the Constitution, this is historic. And, and there's something that I realize now that I didn't get before as a Seventh-day Adventist. I'm gonna read this short quote to you. Uh, this is from Testimonies, Volume 5, page 451. Listen to this. When Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism, when under the influence of this threefold union our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government, and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. You see, what I understand now, which I didn't get before, I thought that the Constitution wouldn't be repudiated until the Sunday law would be passed. But do you see what's happening? The Constitution is being repudiated right before our very eyes. We're losing our freedoms. The Sunday law is the final crowning act. We're living in the fulfillment of these words. And she said, when you see this, know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan. Oh, what a time to, to be alive. Amen? Amen? Seeing these things fulfilled before us. Number four, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You know this verse. It's taken on a, a better... Uh, hold in my mind because of the spirit of prophecy. I'm so thankful for the spirit of prophecy today, aren't you? Amen. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. You know what this is talking about? This is talking about modern spiritualism. There's a scripture that we need to connect this with, and that's in Revelation chapter 16, if you'll turn there. I just read in that statement from Testimonies, volume 5, about a threefold union, and here's the threefold union in the Bible. Revelation 16, verse 13. I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. That's the battle of Armageddon. What is it that's bringing us right together to the end? Those spirits, evil spirits, we see the invasion of modern spiritualism. I'm not going to belabor this, but you know, back in July, I was traveling and uh, it was on a Friday. And I heard that day the announcement that maybe you heard, that at midnight that night, a book would be released. And the expectation was that in the following 24 hours, the sales of that book would be greater than the sales of any other book throughout all of history. It was the latest Harry Potter book. As I flew back home after that trip, I heard the flight attendant say as he went by, there was a Harry Potter book in every other row of that airplane. Children, adults, young and old, reading Harry Potter. But there is something that we ought to be more disturbed about when it comes to modern spiritualism. In Great Controversy, pages 557 and 558, there is a description of modern spiritualism that ought to arrest our attention. It says, it is true that spiritualism is now changing its form and veiling some of its more objectionable features is assuming a Christian guise. 
But its utterances from the platform and the press have been before the public for many years. And in these, its real character stands revealed. Even in its present form, so far from being more worthy of toleration than formerly, it is really a more dangerous because a more subtle deception. While it formerly denounced Christ in the Bible, it now professes to accept both. But the Bible is interpreted in a manner that is pleasing to the unrenewed heart, while its solemn and vital truths are made of no effect. And here we go. And friends, as you listen to this description, you'll recognize spiritualism is taking the church by storm. I could say the church is. But friends, I want to bring it home. It's even sweeping through Seventh-day Adventist churches. Listen to this. Here it is. Modern spiritualism, love, is dwelt upon as the chief attribute of God. You're very quiet. Somebody's probably thinking, well, the Bible says God is love. That's right. Keep listening. Love is dwelt upon as the chief attribute of God, but it is degraded to a weak sentimentalism, making little distinction between good and evil. God's justice, his denunciations of sin, the requirements of his holy law are all kept out of sight. The people are taught to regard the Decalogue as a dead letter. Pleasing, bewitching fables captivate the senses and lead men to reject the Bible as the foundation of their faith. Christ is as verily denied as before, but Satan has so blinded the eyes of the people that the deception is not discerned. Now, on page 588, there's an even more remarkable statement. Listen to this. As spiritualism more closely imitates the nominal Christianity of the day, it has greater power to deceive and ensnare. Satan himself is converted. Do you hear that? Satan himself is converted after the modern order of things. Do you understand what she's saying? That Christianity will dip to such a low level that even Satan can be considered a convert. That's what we're saying here. He will appear in the character of an angel of light and as the spirits will profess faith in the Bible and manifest respect for the institutions of the church, their work will be accepted as a manifestation of divine power. Let me just point you to a book that you can get from ABC. Have you seen this book? Some of you are nodding, some of you are not. It's called Hidden Heresy. This book was written by your union president, Elder Tom Mostert. The subtitle is, Is Spiritualism Invading Adventist Churches Today? His conclusion is that it is. And he lays it out very succinctly in this book. And it's coming particularly through much of the megachurch movement materials that many of our people are receiving with open arms. And I'm talking especially about, about probably the, well, it is the best-selling uh, book in the evangelical world, The Purpose Driven Life and The Purpose Driven Church and Pastor Rick Warren. You know, if you connect the dots and track people's mentors, you can learn a lot. And it turns out that Rick Warren had a very significant encounter in his life. And I just want to read this to you from an interview with him. And this comes from Christianity Today, November 18, 2002. Listen to this. During his last year in seminary, he, that's Rick Warren, and Kay, his wife, drove west to visit Robert Schuller's Institute for Church Growth. You all know who Robert Schuller is? The Hour of Power. Here's what I go on to read in this interview. This is what Kay, his wife, said. We had a very stony ride out to the conference, she says, because such non-traditional ministry scared her to death. Schuler, though, won them over. He had a profound influence on Rick, Kay says. We were captivated. Did you hear what I read about modern spiritualism? Pleasing, bewitching fables captivate the senses. Now you say, why are you saying that about Robert Schuler? Schuler claims his mentor was uh, none other than Norman Vincent Peale. 
Presumably you know that Peel was a spiritualist. A friend of mine was just recounting to me a few days ago that Norman Vincent Peel was very discouraged in the ministry and he was thinking about bailing when his dead mother appeared to him in his office and assured him that he should not leave the ministry, that, that in fact the Lord would have him continue in ministry and encouraged him to continue. Another story I recently heard was that he looked up into the choir one Sunday morning and there was his father who had died singing in the choir, smiled. And we're talking about a spiritualist who was the mentor for Robert Schuller. Now notice what happened. He, Robert Schuller, had a profound influence on Rick Warren's on Rick Warren, his wife said, we were captivated by his positive appeal to non-believers. I never looked back. Friends, we're talking modern spiritualism. We're living in an amazing time. By the way, that article that I referred to a moment ago about the new pope, see if I can find that again, because there was an amazing statement there. This was from the New York Times. But I wanted you to catch this. Keep in mind, modern spiritualism puts to the front love. Listen to this. Many Catholics who disagree with him, the Pope, on these points, note that his once granite oratory has softened. In the weeks before his election, he delivered lectures with contentious punches at the dictatorship of relativism or filth in the church. But since then, he talks less about sin than about the love of Jesus. Do you hear it? The three unclean spirits like frogs. Well, I don't have time to uh, develop this. I will tell you that um, this next year, we're going to do a study on modern spiritualism that will be on our monthly message, and it'll be called With Lightning Speed. And uh, if you make sure you're on our list, you'll get it. We'll take a closer look. All right, number five, Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, verse 8. I tell you, nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Number five on my list is a most tragic loss of faith. It is indeed, I believe, the fulfillment of this prediction by Christ himself that there would not be faith on the earth, especially where it ought to be found. And I'm talking about a loss of faith in the testimonies. Because Mrs. White herself referred to this as the very last deception. Let me read it to you again, just as a reminder. This is Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 48. Satan is constantly pressing in the spurious to lead away from the truth. The very last deception of Satan will be to make of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Satan will work ingeniously in different ways and through different agencies to unsettle the confidence of God's remnant people in the true testimony. There will be a hatred kindled against the testimony which is satanic. The workings of Satan will be to unsettle the faith of the churches in them. For this reason, Satan cannot have so clear a track to bring in his deceptions and bind up souls in his delusions if the warnings and reproofs and counsels of the Spirit of God are heated. I want you to think particularly about the wording. She said, Satan will work ingeniously. And I'll tell you, what could be more ingenious than a deception that would radically affect the very people who claim to hold her books close to their breast, the very people who claim to embrace the spirit of prophecy, and yet in the end, what do they do? It doesn't say they stomp on them, they burn them. No, it says they're made of none effect. They claim to love the spirit of prophecy, but in the final analysis, it has no effect. And we see this in so many areas. I think about something we touched on already earlier this morning, where we live, the out of the cities message. I tell you, friends, if you take up that message, be prepared for serious opposition. Be prepared for people to try and convince you that actually, Mrs. White said, people ought to live in the city. The very opposite of what she says all sorts of gymnastics to make Mrs. White say the very opposite of what she actually says. It's because we're living in the time of the very last deception. I think about a number of subjects which we don't have time to get into. It so happens that we have some studies available on these topics, but I'll just touch on them. The work of ministers. 
You know, the council, there's a mountain of counsel about how our ministers ought to be working, and we're not following that counsel as a church. How we ought to worship. Even much of the battle over celebration worship versus a so-called traditional worship, even much of that misses something that's in the spirit of prophecy. I'm assuming you know that in the spirit of prophecy, the Lord has given us a plan for worship that would put Adventism out in front, the only game in town. Yet we battle over this issue. We're not following the counsel in education. Even, even our own general conference and the educational branch of our work is declaring grave concern about the future of Seventh-day Adventist education. How about health care? We could talk about that. How to care for the sick. I don't have time this morning. I could read statements against the use of drugs and in favor of using natural remedies. Mrs. White even said it's presumptuous to pray for healing if we don't use natural remedies. How about our diet and what we eat? Such a contentious subject among Seventh-day Adventists who are still fighting over cheese and milk and butter. And even in Mrs. White's day, she was saying we need to start teaching people how to prepare food without these things. A hundred years ago, the very last deception. And then there's one, which I won't go into in depth now, specially crafted for conservative Seventh-day Adventists, especially crafted for students of the spirit of prophecy, careful students. And one day you come across somebody who says, oh, but you know, those books were changed. You can't trust what it says in those books. Friends, don't believe that lie. And it's been amazing to me to see how people throw out the desire of ages, Acts of the Apostles, the great controversy, the testimonies, under this idea, which is really an amazing idea, some of you have heard the idea, that James White somehow was the protector of the spirit of prophecy writings, and when he died, the protector was gone, all hell broke loose, as it were. Evil men began to go in and corrupt the writings under the nose of the prophet. She could do nothing about it, apparently, and the writings are corrupted and you can't trust them. And I have one question for those who promote such a lie. How did the Bible survive without James White? Now, what is all this about? It's all about the last deception. You see, the enemy has a way to worm his way into your life, no matter where you're coming from, friends. But thank the good Lord that bolstering our minds with God's word, if we seek through prayer, we can be saved from these delusions. Well, I've got to wrap this up. What should our response be in light of these five remarkable developments around us? What should our response be? Oh, I think of something Jesus said. It's so apropos right now. John chapter 9. John chapter 9, verse 4. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Friends, it is time to work earnestly for the master. It is time to get a warning message out. We have a work of evangelism to do. Listen to this. This is from... Evangelism, page 30. We have no time to lose. The end is near. The passage from place to place to spread the truth will soon be hedged with dangers on the right hand and on the left. Everything will be placed to obstruct the way of the Lord's messengers so that they will not be able to do that which it is possible for them to do now. We must look our work fairly in the face and advance as fast as possible in aggressive warfare. Here's another one. This is Testimonies, Volume 6, page 22. From the light given me of God, I know that the powers of darkness are working with intense energy from beneath, and with stealthy tread, Satan is advancing to take those who are now asleep. i got to stop right here. I left an amazing quote out, so pardon me. i got to go back and read this to you, because I, I remembered it when I just read this. Satan is advancing. How? With stealthy tread. Listen to this. This is a quote from one of Rick Warren's prayers at a purpose-driven church seminar for church leaders. Here is the quote from his prayer. Thank you that there is a movement, a stealth movement, that's flying beneath the radar, 
that's changing literally hundreds, even thousands of churches around the world. How do you like that? A stealth movement. All right, back to the quote. With stealthy tread, Satan is advancing to take those who are now asleep. As a wolf taking his prey, we have warnings now which we may give, a work now which we may do, but soon it will be more difficult than we can imagine. God help us to keep in the channel of light, to work with our eyes fastened on Jesus, our leader, and patiently, perseveringly press on to gain the victory. But you see, we're faced with a dilemma. You know what the dilemma is? We're supposed to do evangelism. We're supposed to proclaim the message at this very time. That's the commission. In fact, I can't find any way out. No excuses. It's what we're supposed to be doing. But listen to this. The Lord could not now bring many souls into the truth because of the church members that have never been converted and those who were once converted but who have backslidden. What good would these unconsecrated members do the new converts? They would make of none effect the message God has given His people to bear. This is from Manuscript Release, uh, Releases, Volume 21, page 34. Oh, what do we need to do? Well, we know what our first work is, right? Didn't the Lord tell us? In mercy, it's time for a revival, isn't it? A time to wake up. You know, the word revive means to live again. We need a revival. I jotted down something. I jotted down what Mrs. White said we need to do for a revival. A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. There must be earnest effort to obtain the blessing of the Lord not because God is not willing to bestow His blessing upon us, but because we're unprepared to receive it. Our Heavenly Father is more willing to give His Holy Spirit to them that ask Him than our earthly parents to give good gifts to their children. But it is our work by confession, humiliation, repentance, and earnest prayer to fulfill the conditions upon which God has promised to grant us His blessing. A revival need be expected only in answer to earnest prayer. That's from Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 121. Oh, I want to engage in prayer, earnest prayer, as never before, for a revival in my own life. How about you? That we'll see a revival in our churches. By the way, there's something else, an important ingredient. No revival has ever taken place without it. It's a study of God's Word. Study of His Word, especially a study of prophecy. And finally, the closing verse of our key text today, Romans 13, verse 14, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no revival outside of Jesus. And when the apostle said to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, he was using the same language that was used in putting on clothes. To put on the Lord Jesus Christ, those garments of Christ's righteousness. How do we do that? Just a 60-second review Aren't you thankful for the promise that was quoted in the, in the youth sermon this morning? You remember it? 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm so thankful for the gift of forgiveness, aren't you? We need to seek Jesus earnestly for it, and He offers it freely. But then in that promise it said, and Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, there's no big mystery. It's not just a, a magical touch. It's not something, as we study in our lesson today, that is done without any effort on our part. We make the decision as to whether or not we're going to experience the cleansing power of Jesus each day. Whether or not we're going to experience His converting power. As I read in Signs of the Times, 1894, the heart must be purified by obedience to the truth. As we choose to obey God's Word, we experience that converting power to change our lives. I want it, don't you? Let's seek Him for that in prayer right now. What do you say? Dear Heavenly Father, thank You so much 
for a more sure word of prophecy, I pray that we would take heed unto it. I pray, Lord, for revival among us. I pray that you'd help us to make the decision to engage in earnest prayer and in Bible study and to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only that we'll be ready, but that we can be instruments to help others be ready too. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. information write to us at post office box 281 Malo, washington 99150 or visit us on the web at www.backtoenoch.org goodbye and god bless you